I want to show you what true power looks like. When the gates get blown open and nothing is off the table and the consequences quite literally cause two thirds of a whole game to be sunset. Let me warp you to a time where it was all brand new and not a single soul could see weapons this powerful being a part of Destiny 2. Let's meet the Pinnacle Weapons. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Their links will be in the description of this video as well as the music too. Guys, I can't recommend Advanced GG enough. Link is in the description. If we get 300 code uses, they said they would make a nice insulated ice shaker for us with our logo on it. And I think we can do it. Thank you guys so much for the support so far. Let's keep crushing it. Remember, link to Advanced GG in the description. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, Come by my Discord, and I will answer all of those for you. This is not an ad, but thank you guys so much for watching and supporting so far. I just really like the product. And use code EVAN at checkout if you're interested. The subscriber that changed all of YouTube forever. That could be you, but you chose not to subscribe and not to hit the bell. Wow. Just... Wow. Anyway, for the rest of the Chads and the Chadettes who sub with the bell on... Enjoy the video. To start our journey, let's go all the way back to 2014 with the release of Vanilla Destiny. You may ask, why are we here? Is this for nostalgia bait or is this some sort of foreshadowing at play? Actually, we're here to talk about loadouts. Year one Destiny 1 veterans may remember rocking the fabled Arc Hand Cannon Fatebringer the Solar Sniper Rifle Black Hammer, and the exotic rocket launcher Galahorn for a good portion of their playtime. All three of these weapons have been turned into exotics at some point or another, with Galahorn always being an exotic, Black Hammer being turned into the Black Spindle, and then the Whisper of the Worm, and Fatebringer having been an exotic with Rise of Iron, and later brought back with an adept legendary in Destiny 2. These weapons were the precursor to pinnacle weapons because they simply were a part of everyone's inventory. Fatebringer's perk pool combined with it being an arc weapon in the primary slot, Black Hammer being a legendary sniper rifle filled with ammo and the perk White Nail, so three headshots in a row refunded that ammo. And Galahorn just... well, being the face of desirable exotics in Destiny. Oh my god, they got fucking Galahorn! Oh my god, look at my heavy weapon now! Oh my god, I got the fucking Galahorn! I got a fucking Galahorn! Oh my god! Oh my fucking god! Eventually, these weapons made up the only loadout players took into raids, and the only time in Destiny 1 that the power was swung so heavily that Bungie had to intervene. This one weapon loadout was the catalyst for the first ever round of sunsetting, and Bungie went hard on these weapons, going as far as to even exclude the exotic Galahorn from infusing in year 2. But that was the price to pay to fix the 3 weapon or nothing meta in year 1, making sure it will never happen again. Bungie lost a ton of players shortly after the launch of Destiny 2, since the game just simply wasn't ready to ship. It wasn't what the player base wanted or expected, and we can come up with a million theories as to why. Was it Activision's pressure for profits? Was it due to arrogance on Bungie's part? We don't know for sure, but what we do know is that the game was panned for slower movement speeds, sluggish combat, and boring mission designs at launch missing the reward structure that players had received from Year 3 of Destiny 1, and instead prioritizing public events and easy exotics. Let's just say that the power fantasy wasn't there, and wouldn't return until the Whisper of the Worm exotic quest shook the game back to life. 
Whisper was part one of the new era. The other part is one I don't think a lot of players know about, Riedrich's Claymore. The Claymore, not the broadsword, was a grind to grab it as it required the player to reach 2200 elo in the competitive Crucible playlist. It was such a grind that even poor Azdakross sounded tired recording this video. Is this gun worth the trouble? Because man, I will tell you this, nothing will make you question your sanity more than playing ranked. This doesn't sound like a lot by today's standards, but as Sam Chandler pointed out in his article for Shaq's News, quote, someone with a perfectly even 50% win to loss rate in competitive Crucible will need to play around 440 games to get the necessary 2200 points in order to reach Fabled Glory rank. If 440 games sounds like a lot, it is. Now, not only did Glory barely reward points and streaks were everything needed to progress, I'd say the most exhausting part of all of this for the player base was the skill-based matchmaking inside the Crucible. For the players that made it out of this hell though, the reward was a pulse rifle that dropped with an exclusive perk, Desperado. This perk worked by giving this pulse rifle the double the rate of fire after getting a headshot and reloading. This definitely sounded great, and it could be great, but Graviton Lance already dominated the game, and despite being an exotic, it was far easier to get than Redrix. So players didn't even need to farm Redrix anyway. Also, the game didn't nearly have the population Bungie clearly aimed for. So the playlist was filled with high tier players and streamers, and that was it. The era just wasn't there yet for Pinnacle Weapons. Yet. That era would come in the form of Destiny 2 Forsaken, my favorite time for the franchise so far. Forsaken just nailed the recipe, but kind of also had a free pass at it. Let me explain. Vanilla Destiny 2 had a double primary weapon system with a focus on slow and methodical gameplay with ability regen, super regen, and movement being a far cry from their D1 speeds. Forsaken sought to correct this with random rolls, faster supers, and double special weapons if you wanted to do that. Forsaken was the true sequel to Destiny 1 Year 3, and with that era of random rolls back, special weapons being allowed in both the kinetic and the energy slot, and abilities getting buffed across the board, the year of power fantasy came to life. I have a question for all of you before we start going over pinnacles. What was your favorite pinnacle and why? Let me know in the comments. So let's begin with the release of Forsaken and the real start of pinnacle weapons. September 4th, 2018. The Crucible vendor, Lord Shax, had two pinnacle weapon quests. One new and, um, well, Redrick's broadsword instead of Claymore. The broadsword was a controversial one, with Bungie saying that the Claymore quest wouldn't return, yet the same gun with a new name was given for an albeit grindy, but not as frustrating quest. The actual new weapon was the Luna's Howl quest. This was a 7 step quest which had the player completing 10 crucible matches in the competitive playlist, then killing 150 guardians with hand cannons in the competitive playlist, so on and so forth, you get the point. The final step was to reach the rank of Fabled in the Crucible competitive playlist. Fabled rank was 2100, and again, this was not an easy task with the same struggles of matchmaking in place. After all of this, Luna's Howl was in the player's hands, and it being a 180 solar hand cannon with the perk Magnificent Howl made it an extremely powerful choice in both PvE and PvP, since it was the only 180 that could two-tap headshot players. The perk reads, quote, Rapidly landing two precision shots increases the next shot's damage for a short duration. This made the weapon pretty powerful. But what if I told you that Luna's Howl was a worse version of its big secret brother? That's right, after the Luna's Howl quest was over, Lord Shax had a new one for the player. The goal for this mysterious weapon was simple, reach max rank in competitive crucible. 
be the best of the best of the best and kill 500 guardians with the Luna's Howl. Once this monumental task was accomplished by you and your friends, or someone getting paid for a recovery service, the weapon was now yours. Destiny's best legendary 180 hand cannon in the energy slot for Forsaken. Gone, but not forgotten. Not Forgotten was the exact same as Luna's Howl, but with one minor difference on paper, but in game, a major impact. A heavy amount of range instead of stability. These paired with the returning chaperone shotgun melted the crucible down and led to a lot of teams actually using these in raids on day one. An insane time for 180 hand cannons and an insane time to be a Destiny player fulfilling power fantasy. Later down the road, Luna's Howl and Not Forgotten would be changed into 150 hand cannons and also nerfed damage-wise to only have the perk work on body shots, and to say the community was not happy is a drastic understatement. These were both the only 180 hand cannons that could two-tap to the head, and ever since these days, 180s have really never been worth using. Not Forgotten in Luna's Howl turned into 150s, then later 140s for even less impact. Pour two out for our boys. Redrix would also have its perk reissued in Beyond Light with the returning Messenger, but rest in peace to the first era of many pinnacle weapons in Destiny 2. From the first real era of pinnacle weapons, and straight into the start of each vendor offering pinnacle quests, comes Black Armory. Black Armory was my favorite season of Destiny 2, and the very first one Destiny had to offer. There was a raid, Niobe Labs, Forge Weapons, Anarchy, Izanagi's Burden, the story of Ada 1, and of course, Destiny's most iconic pinnacle weapon. Loaded question. Just kidding, it was Mountaintop. Mountaintop very much was the gun that took over the kinetic slot, but nobody was talking about it yet. Why? Well, grenade launchers weren't that strong yet, so nobody really cared about a special ammo grenade launcher, and the quest for Mountaintop was a pain in the fuck. Crucible had the Mountaintop quest with an easy beginning. Just win five or six competitive Crucible games, right? That's easy. All right. Now to the parts that people spent weeks on. You need to remember that there wasn't a ton of breach loaders in the game, nor did most players know how to use them. They were underpowered compared to today, to say the very least. And Bungie wanted people to get 750 points from final blows. Each kill with a grenade launcher only counted as 3 points in regular crucible and 10 in competitive, so 250 grenade launcher kills in regular crucible or 75 in competitive, oh my fuck! Fighting Lion would be the only weapon that a lot of players would use here, but for the gamers, Militia's Birthright was the breach loader of choice. After this step was eventually done, after all the pain that is. The next step was somehow more painful. The next step required 200 points from double kills. Are you fucking kidding me, man? So all those times you may have been happy getting a single kill with Fighting Lion was about to turn into getting double kills with the damn thing. The only saving grace was that auto-loading weapons was a thing from Luna Faction Boots and Rally Barricades. But without those, my god was this a struggle. But you know what they say, when the going gets tough, you bust out the heavy grenade launchers. Yeah, that was going to be the only way you really got this damn gun. And heavy ammo didn't work how it does now. You couldn't just get heavy ammo as a team. Only one person got it. So people were just camping the heavy ammo pack the whole game. Really fun. The best part of it, though, is that it was only two points for every double kill in regular Crucible and five for every kill in competitive. So a hundred double kills or more in regular Crucible and 40 in competitive. <sighs> OK, so that was stressful, right? An actual pinnacle challenge that didn't hold back. 
Well, we aren't done. After this, it was another 100 points from calculated trajectory kills, which were just mid-air grenade launcher kills. 100 of those in regular or 25 in competitive. Now I just get 2100 in competitive crucible again, just like Luna's house. Super fun, right? Super fun. You know, if you think about it, though, this weapon did dominate for two years after. So I guess that's the price you had to pay for something that was truly pinnacle. And Mountaintop, as many players know by now, was the most pinnacle of pinnacle guns, rocking the perk Micro Missile, which turned a grenade launcher into a full-on rocket launcher. Micro Missile didn't allow Mountaintop any drop-off with the projectile. Mountaintop also came with spike grenades for insane damage and sticky grenades to kill your teammates with in Reckoning or for speedrunners to climb on top of. This gun was a part of everyone's loadout for the next two years, but it would also take until Season of Opulence to really start seeing that. Being a part of boss bakes, day one loadouts, any nightfall, any raid, just anything including PvP, this gun never left your side. And there's another weapon for that reason that we'll talk about a bit later into the video, but after all this was done, and all the pain that myself and thousands if not millions of other people experienced, it was worth it. This quest was nerfed on difficulty two different times to my knowledge, and the gun that eventually did get sunset wouldn't see any actual nerfs to it until it was already sunset. Mountaintop, we all love to hate you by the end of your life, but dearly miss how powerful you were every single day. Pour one out in the comments for our lost brethren. All right. Now for the less interesting pinnacles in Black Armory. Loaded question. Oh boy, this fusion rifle. Really cool idea, but never really got its time to shine. Loaded question was less of a question of if you were going to get it to drop, and more of a question of if you ever wanted to use it. I get that in Season 15, fusion rifles are a big thing now, but back in Black Armory, this thing was just not good. I hate to keep making this pun, but the quest also raised some questions on how this was considered pinnacle in the first place. 500 fusion rifle kills, 1000 arc kills, and 40 strikes. That's it. Nothing more. This weapon has had its perk come back in Destiny 2 with the Ritual Fusion Rifle Null Composure and the perk Reservoir Burst, which states that if the battery is full, the shot does increase damage and explodes on kills of enemies. This fusion rifle is what I would say isn't a pinnacle perk since it just never was effective and the Vanguard's first showing of pinnacles looked kind of weak compared to King Crucible. But there was another vendor that wanted to get in on the pinnacle game. Let's meet our third pinnacle activity in Black Armory, the Breakneck Quest. Breakneck was way more of a grind than the Vanguard simply because you had to play Gambit. I'm just kidding. It was because of how many games of Gambit you had to play. 40 matches of Gambit, 500 auto rifle kills, 150 auto rifle multi kills, and 150 challenging enemies in Gambit killed. It's easy to see by this point that some pinnacle quests required a lot more effort than others, but Breakneck and Loaded Question felt like they could be done casually by playing the game over time, while Mountaintop, Luna's Howl, and Not Forgotten were ridiculously more skewed in difficulty. Breakneck was such an underrated weapon that in today's game, a lot of players would actually like to have it. This was a 450 RPM auto rifle with Rampage for more damage and the perk Onslaught, which increased the rate of fire the more stacks of Rampage you had. The higher the RPM, going from a 450 to a 600 to a 720 RPM auto rifle with some nutty damage to stack. Breakneck would actually receive three buffs all at once in the Season of the Drifter, because each of the auto rifle types we listed all received a buff too, making this gun a menace to deal with. But again, there was another buff that happened in the Season of the Drifter that we also need to speak about and a weapon that made any chance of using Breakneck absolutely not happen. So before we jump into the season of the Drifter and what the hell happened, I do want to ask you, would you like to see the perk Onslaught come back? 
I think it absolutely has a place in Destiny 2 right now. All right, let's do it. Let's just jump right into it. I'll cut straight to the chase, seeing as how long this video already is. Season of the Drifter buffed grenade launchers so that the breakneck would never get used, and instead, Mountaintop would have the start of its takeover. Breach loader grenade launchers and spike grenades were both buffed, but what made this season especially strong was part two of the dominant forces, the Recluse. Recluse was so iconic and phenomenal of a weapon that I think the Witch Queen even has it as an exotic for a pre-order bonus. The gun, thank god, was easier than the mountaintop to get for sure, requiring fabled rank in competitive crucible and 100 wins in crucible to acquire. Alright, don't kill me for this one. The recluse was the cherry on top of the mountaintop because of its perk, Master of Arms. Master of Arms worked by allowing any weapon kills, whether it be special ammo, heavy, or recluse itself, to proc the perk and allow for 50% extra damage on headshots and 150% extra damage to the body. So not only do you have a perk that's better than Rampage and Kill Clip, but it can also be proc from another gun and the body shot damage is equivalent to headshots. On a Void SMG, that was the best of its class. Oh, and it had Feeding Frenzy, which meant that any kill head or body would juice up the reload speed of this bad boy. This is officially where Mountaintop and Recluse combo came into play big time for the Destiny community. And the worst part of both of these is that they were practically the same in PvP, so they were everywhere. Remember when we said Year 1 of Destiny 1 had a problem? Well now Destiny 2 had created that problem again, this time even worse than before. Because while Destiny 1 was only in PvE that the problem existed, in Destiny 2, this never left your loadout. Recluse would have to be not just knocked down, but downright massacred to get people to stop using it. We'll start at the beginning. Luna Faction Boots not allowing for infinite reload. That's a good start. Master of Arms body damage was nerfed hard. That's a better start. Feeding Frenzy was also nerfed, so you had to get multiple kills to acquire that same reload speed. That's another good one. And so was the other weapons giving the same increased damage to it. So you had to get kills with Recluse to get the bonus damage. But even then, my goodness, did people start using this thing every single day until it was eventually sunset. That was going to be the only way for this meta to officially die. Did you guys rock Recluse and Mountaintop every single day? Don't lie to me. I know you did, because I did too. And for that one guy who used one-eyed mask with him in Crucible, I hope you're missing a battery in your remote. Another fantastic pinnacle weapon to come from the Season of the Drifter was the 21% Delirium. This was a heavy machine gun with more than double the rate of fire of any other machine gun and had a brand new perk to Destiny 2 called Overflow. So picking up ammo gave this gun an already insane rate of fire 132 shots in the magazine. But that wasn't even the pinnacle perk to the weapon. No, that was just part one. Killing Tally was that pinnacle perk, and it was basically a better Rampage since it lasted longer and was a bit stronger than Rampage. Not only that, but machine guns in this season were insanely strong and had incredible range being basically snipers. Even easier, the quest which just needed the player to reset their infamy and kill some bosses in the brand new Gambit Prime. Gambit Prime, Delirium, Peanut Butter, Jelly. Just like the rest on this list though, the Delirium would get a nerf, and then eventually Sunset. I think my favorite part of Delirium was the weird little quirks to it, where you could shoot the pots in the Leviathan raid and they would count as kills. So you could proc killing tally without actually killing anything. Except for Callus's nice hard work on those ceramics. You monster. The nerf was to machine guns in general, so Delirium was kind of a side effect of that. 
but it didn't stop this thing from raining terror in every activity that required ad clearing. Machine Gun doesn't even really come close to describing how much this thing dominated and how much I miss this thing. I think Delirium should come back in some way. I would love to see it. All right, now for the boring one, Oxygen SR3, which was a scout rifle. Oh, oh. With a better dragonfly for exploding if you hit more targets before the final headshot. This was just not a good weapon, and it remained in everyone's vault after acquiring it. You just couldn't compete with Mountaintop or Recluse, and a 180 RPM scout rifle with a weird dragonfly wasn't even going to be able to come close to Master of Arms and Micro Missile. Vanguard was now 0 for 2. This was one that I don't think players really cared if it was sunset or not. And yeah, I guess we could see this perk return, but I don't think people would want to use it over something like explosive payload anyway. So yeah, maybe just keep this one. The Season of Opulence was the last era of Pinnacle Weapons, and brought easily the most annoying of the bunch, while also bringing one of my favorite to the game. So let's just get the annoying one out of the way first. Meet Revoker. Revoker was another PvP Pinnacle, and now it's safe to say that PvP won the Pinnacle Weapon War, of which was the best, with Revoker being another cherry on top of Mountaintop and Recluse if you just wanted to have some fun with a sniper. Revoker was earned for reaching 3500 rank in competitive, and needed 50 headshots with snipers and 300 sniper kills. This gun to me had a backwards perk. The perk was called Reversal of Fortune, and it rewarded players who missed shots with refunded ammo, being a baby icebreaker for regenerating ammo from nothing. Now, this sniper wasn't a sniper that hit lightly either. In fact, Revoker was a 72 RPM high impact sniper rifle, so even a body shot would leave you almost dead. Revoker was the most annoying to play against for me since it just rewarded missing and led to snipers being a menace in the crucible. Plus, it had snapshot for even faster aim down sights too. I honestly hope that this pinnacle stays retired because, oh boy, this one got old so quickly. You gotta think, a bad player could miss snipes and be rewarded for it. A good player could miss snipes and be rewarded for it. On top of that, there were even weird little bugs, where if you shot people's barriers, you would get ammo back because technically that's a miss to the player. Snipers weren't really nerfed back then either, so flinch wasn't really a thing, and the cones to hit people were a lot more forgiving. You'd run straight into a wall of red lights when Revoker came out. Moving on from Revoker, and on to Gambit's final pinnacle weapon, we have Hush. No, not the YouTuber, although I do, I do like Hush. No, this was an energy bow and needed a bunch of bow kills in Gambit. He comes with the perk Archer's Gambit, which states that hit five precision hits grant a massive draw speed for a short duration. The bow wasn't recluse and there wasn't any champions or mods for this weapon at the time for it to get used much. This bow was... Okay. Okay, Evan, I can't read this, man. Come on, it's it's a bow with, with my name. Man, I, I gotta say it to people. I'm, I'm sorry, buddy. This is your video. You can, you can just, I don't know, <clears throat> buy me a pizza or something? I don't know. Yeah, guys, it wasn't that good and falls in line with the breakneck as a weapon I could see taking over the game. I would love to see this one come back in Destiny in some way, but for now, we leave it there and subscribe to Hush. Thank you. The final pinnacle weapon of Destiny 2 was the Wendigo GL3. The Wendigo GL3 was a heavy ammo grenade launcher that not only had auto-loading holster and blinding grenades, but it also had a new pinnacle perk, Explosive Light. Now, Explosive Light may sound familiar, since it just came back with the Ascendancy rocket launcher, which actually inspired me to make this video. But don't be fooled, this perk was significantly better here for a few reasons. Explosive Light could stack up six times for the six shots in the magazine, based on the number of orbs picked up, and that would charge each shot to do 
well, a lot more damage. The Wendigo would get outmatched when it first came out simply because of all the buff and debuff stacking a Swarm of the Raven could do with Tractor Cannon. Bosses back in those days with all those different stacks really just got run over. However, Wendigo would come back to life with the hot swapping meta of Grenade Launchers and Izanagi's Burden. I love this gun so much, and it was the only Vanguard Pinnacle really worth picking up for the endgame. So, Wendigo, I miss you, but you are a forever sunset. Those are all of the Pinnacle weapons that Destiny 2 had to offer. And oh my god, this video is already this long, so I'll just speed this next portion up for the five of you still here. Pinnacle weapons were the reason for sunsetting, and now I hope you can see why. I mean, with this many guns all being the best of their class and not even exotic, that meant you could run very busted perks together with no risk of loadouts, no champion mods to worry about, just one large problem. In the coming years, Ritual Weapons would take over the Pinnacle Weapon idea in a less strong manner. But there's even still some outliers that are definitely dominant to this day. I'm talking about you, Salvager Salvo. Some of the perks like Explosive Light and Reservoir Burst and even Desperado have even come back. But some of these perks like Master of Arms and Micro Missile should probably never come back to the game unless they're exotic. We mentioned that the Witch Queen has an exotic submachine gun which looks awfully close to Recluse, so I wouldn't be surprised if Pinnacle Perks make their way back into exotics, just like their Destiny 1 counterparts did. So again, why make this video? Well, A, I wanted to, and B, because I think this is why sunsetting was inevitable. How do you fix the problem of power creep to the point where nobody even wants to check out new weapons, where old ones become irrelevant? You can't power creep and make even more busted ones to balance, so you sunset those problems with everything else. There is an argument to be made that everything getting nuked because of a few problematic weapons isn't exactly fair, but it already happened. The idea of Pinnacle Weapons was great, but unfortunately, the execution created a much larger problem. Sure, people are using new weapons, but the backlash of sunsetting, which I won't go over here since I made a whole video earlier this year talking about it, was another thing. I think in the future, if Bungie is ever going to sunset weapons again, they should just come out and say that there are some problematic weapons in the game and that those would be sunset you wouldn't have the same outcry. People would have been mad, no doubt, but I mean, people are always mad about anything in Destiny. But it wouldn't have been the same level of backlash. Look at the way Anarchy was handled. Nerfed almost to the point where people have no reason to use it, and the artifact is actively working against it. Sure, that's a good solution, but Anarchy reigned supreme for way too long before it was honed in. I think Bungie is an ambitious company. I think they do things unlike any other game, and sometimes they nail it, and other times not as much. But I can tell you that I was happy to be a part of the Pinnacle era, and I feel like it's almost inevitable to happen again one day. And you already know I'll be there for that day. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, a like would be greatly appreciated as well as a subscription. Remember to watch my Twitch stream since I'm live there almost every single day. And until next time, guys, enjoy the bloopers. Mm. What? Yo! Has Brenda bought me a PC yet? Hey, Brenda, have you bought me a PC yet? Well, there you go. <laughs>